This is a detailed introduction and a technical rundown on system design interview concepts that you need to know to ace your job interview. The system design interview usually doesn't have to do much with coding, people don't want to see you write actual code, but how you glue an entire system together, and that is part of the job interview, especially for senior engineer positions. So let's run through some of the top concepts that you may need to know for your system design interview. To start, let's say you have a single server that is accepting requests and sending responses to your web or mobile application. But now we are getting more users, so we need to scale it. The easiest way would be to upgrade the server by adding more RAM or upgrading the CPU. This is known as vertical scaling, it's pretty straightforward and easy but also very limited. A better approach would be to add replicas of that server so that each one of them can handle a subset of requests. This is known as horizontal scaling. It's more powerful because we can almost scale infinitely and we don't even need good machines. It also adds more reliability because if one of our servers goes down, our other servers can continue to fulfill requests, which eliminates our previous single point of failure. Because if we have just one server which goes down, all of our users won't be able to access our website. But how do we make sure that one of our servers won't get overloaded while others are idle? For that we need a load balancer that distributes requests to multiple servers instead of sending all of them to one server. Load balancer is just a server, also known as a reverse proxy. It uses algorithms to determine where to forward each request. For example it can use the least connection algorithm to check which servers have the fewest connections open at the time and send traffic to those servers. Or it can be a resource-based algorithm which distributes load based on what resources each server has available at the time. There are also other algorithms like IP hashing, round robin or you can even set up your own custom script to determine where to forward each request. There are also various techniques for load balancing. One is you can use specialized software like Nginx, AWS Elastic Load Balancing or Azure's Load Balancer and set it up as a reverse proxy where you can route your requests to multiple IP addresses. Another popular technique is to just use DNS and many people would use DNS as a load balancer instead of setting up themselves by assigning multiple IP addresses for their domain. And the benefit here is that you don't have to set up another machine for load balancing, but the downside is that you don't have much customizability as well. So that's the first technique and it's a very simple one, but the thing to know is usually your web server is not the first one to go down. Quite often it's your database server, which may be under high load for lots of writes and reads. And in order to handle that, that brings us to the next concept, which is caching. Caching is the process of storing in temporary storage so that in the future data can be served faster while also reducing the load from the database. The cache is stored in the computer's RAM memory, which is a lot faster to access than reading from the hard drive. Usually the cache is on a separate server, very often it's in the same load balancer server. There are some softwares that power such caching, for example Redis, Nginx, Memcache, Cassandra and others. But how do we make sure that the cache is always up to date with the database we have? To not have inconsistent data in your cache, you need to do caching invalidation with one of these algorithms. First one is write through cache. You can change the value on the cache first, then in the database. There is also write back cache where you only change the cache first and then you have a cron job that syncs it with the database later. In web applications, caching can be used at various levels, including client side caching. This involves caching resources such as images, scripts, and style sheets in the browser's cache. In case of browser caching, the cache data can be stored in the user's browser itself. In case of browser caching, the cache data can be stored in the user's browser itself. It will store the cached data in a cache folder and then the data can be accessed from there. There is also server-side caching, which involves caching data or responses at the server level. In the server-side caching, the cached data is stored in the server itself. This can be done using softwares like Memcache, Redis or Nginx. And we also have database caching, which involves caching frequently accessed database queries or results in memory. 
It can be done using technologies like query caching in MySQL or the caching libraries like Redis, Memcache and others. And the fourth type of caching is actually a separate technique itself which is called CDN or Content Delivery Network. CDNs are networks of servers distributed across different locations that store cached copies of web content such as images, videos and scripts. In CDN caching, the cached data is stored on the servers of the CDN provider. Then the CDN provider replicates the content across its servers and serves the content to users from the server closest to them. It helps with accelerating any website by caching its files in servers around the world. There are two ways you can set up CDNs. First type is pool based. This is when first time user requests data from the server. It goes to the CDN server. But CDN doesn't have your files, so it makes a request to the origin server. Origin server sends the data to the CDN. And then CDN server stores these files and sends it back to the user. And the second time the user requests data from the server, it goes to the closest CDN again. But since it already has the data cached in the server, it doesn't contact the origin server and immediately serves the files to the client. There is also the push based CDNs where you will upload your files in the origin server and that gets pushed to the CDNs before users request so that it's faster when they request it. Some of the popular CDN options are Cloudflare, Google Cloud CDN, Amazon CloudFront and Microsoft Azure CDN. And the last part that we're going to talk about is API design. The best way to think about this is what is the interface between the client and the web server. When designing an API, these are the most important parts to think about. First, identify the type of the API. Are you going for a RESTful API, a GraphQL API, or a gRPC? Second, choose the communication protocol. This could be HTTP, WebSockets, or others. Next, you have to identify the data transport mechanism. Are you going to use JSON, XML, or protocol buffers, and what does the data look like? Clarity is also important. The endpoints should do exactly what they are expected to do. For example, on a get request to slash posts, you would expect the API to return the list of posts, not to modify or mutate any data in the same get request. Next, the inputs and outputs of each endpoint should be defined. When you make a request to fetch some properties, what are the parameters you are passing along? Similarly, what can you expect in return? Security is another part of designing APIs. You have to set up authentication mechanisms and decide how you are going to grant access to the private endpoints. You also have to set up logging, secure headers and rate limiting on your API and other security guidelines to make sure that your API is secure. Then there is the aspect of querying and sorting. How do you retrieve and sort data based on certain properties in the query? Pagination is also important. You don't want to get all data in one request. You need to paginate it using some sort of query limiting. Performance is also crucial in API design. Imagine an app loading for the first time. It's better to have it load the website without making a server query initially and then make background requests as the site is loading. And lastly, error mechanisms need to be handled with care. How are errors returned? Are they consistent and informative enough to aid debugging? And when designing APIs, it can be focused more on the server side or it can be focused more on the client side. In case of server-driven design, you have more control over logic from the server side. This is particularly useful for mobile apps, where each release requires approval from the App Store and Play Store. In this case, you can decide what to render and what actions to trigger. On the other hand, client-driven design offers more flexibility on the client side. Another part of the system design interview is to design and suggest scaling mechanisms for databases. Let me know if you'd like to learn more about that and I will make a separate video for that. Now before you get to the system design interview, you first need to pass the live coding interview stage. If you're interested to learn more about that part, I recommend you check out this video next about how to solve interview coding problems.